the last program we talked about behavioral psychology the classical conditioning of pavlo briefly the contribution of watson now let us talk about some more behavioral psychologists i start with b f skinner b f skinner was an american psychologist was born in 1904 and died quite recently 1990 he was very influential from the 1930s to 60s what he is associated with is the concept operant conditioning skinner was interested in education and he believed that behavior is sustained by reinforcement or rewards and not by free will the free will is something associated with cognitive psychology that we'll talk about later he thought if you reward for a particular response the students are likely to repeat that if you punish then they will abstain from doing that un desirable response is famous for what you call the skinner box the teaching machine or the programmed learning often it worked with pigeons and rats and what he learned from them from the birds and animals he transferred them to the teaching and learning of human beings skinner was very very influential even during the world war there's a famous episode which will tell us more about behaviorism and also some of the pitfalls shortcomings of behaviorism when it was applied in different situations during the world war when the american soldiers were sent to japan they followed b f skinner's advice in training the american soldiers to pick up the japanese language they thought if the japanese language was spoken by the american soldiers they would establish a kind of cultural rapport with the people of japan and therefore a curriculum was designed vocabulary was decided sentence patterns were also chosen and the american soldiers were given drilling in using japanese language and when they actually landed in japan when they started speaking japanese no japanese understood so it became a utter failure now this is taken as one of the examples of how the operant conditioning will not work in all conditions but before we come to that let us try to understand what operant conditioning means i as explained by skinner operant conditioning involves stimulus and response this involves conditioning voluntary controllable behavior not the automatic physiological responses in classical condition with the operant conditioning the response comes before the stimulus the opposite of cc now this is very interesting both belong to the behavioral psychology school but they reverse the process in pavlov's case stimulus comes first and response comes later but in the case of operant conditioning as explained by skinner response comes first even before the stimulus is shown how let us look at what really happens operant conditioning is explained well taking the classroom situation teachers can deliberately use operant conditioning with their student training how someone reacts to our behaviors determines whether or not we continue the behavior if we are rewarded for something we will likely to do it again and if we don't then we may not get the reward in simple terms if for example 
the children at the LKG or UKG or in the lower classes are to be groomed, disciplined, then operant conditioning is applied. You reward the children and you also punish the children. If the children behave in a particular way, then they get say a chocolate or a biscuit or they get some gifts. If they do not behave, then the reward will not be there and you can extend it to program learning. When you come out with the right kind of answer, you get a few marks or a tick mark saying right, that is the reward. And if you give wrong answer, you would not get that, you will get a negative marking. And this will enable the people or the students who learn to be very, very cautious in responding. Even before the test is conducted, they get ready, they want to perform, they want to score. 10 out of 10. Look at the recent example of results of 10th class. Everybody wanted to get 10 out of 10. How many millions of children appeared for the CBSE examination? Ultimately, 1.6 lakhs, 160,000 students got 10 out of 10 points GPA, but others did not. Now, this is something which happens even before the test in the sense they mentally prepare themselves to get the maximum and the test comes later. You do not know what kind of questions will appear. You do not know how you will perform in your SAT and GRE or any competitive examination for that matter. You may look at the old question papers, but you also be prepared for something new. The same questions may not be repeated and you have to prepare yourself even for that eventuality. The best example is to look at the kind of new questions framed which may not have been taught inside the class. So, that is the best way to explain this response stimulus concept of B. F. Skinner. Let me explain further. Look at this diagram. Positive reinforcement means presence of pleasant stimulus, negative reinforcement, absence of unpleasant stimulus, punishment, presence of unpleasant stimulus. Now, in the first case, positive reinforcement or even absence of unpleasant stimulus makes the behavior increase, go up, behavior increases. In the case of punishment, presence of unpleasant stimulus, behavior decreases. You take a typical village school, I do not know because of the new laws these days, corporal punishment is banned, prohibited by law. But when we were students, there was no such law and therefore, the teachers used to come with a stick, a twig. And if anyone went on talking, the teacher would call the student to come and show his palm and would give a beating. Now, that is punishment and there are different kinds of punishments. The degree of cruelty would depend on how severe the punishment as decided by the teacher. Now, that is one kind of unpleasant stimulus. But even without corporal punishment, you can give 0 mark or minus marks, minus grades. That is unpleasant. If you do not give any grade, it may not be unpleasant in the normal sense, but still if you do not get any grade or marks, you would feel that you have not succeeded.
in solving that particular question or answering that question. So, positive reinforcement when I think the mathematics <coughs> is one subject where you can look at this positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, punishment etcetera in a very, very clear way. When you go on solving the problems in mathematics, you work out the steps, you arrive at a solution and then at the end you turn to the key and you, your answer tallies with the key given, then that is the greatest reward you get and you tend to do more uh, mass, mass problems. If you do not get the answer, then you try again and this is an example of positive reinforcement acting as a pleasant stimulus which increases that particular kind of behavior. Now, consequences of behaviors obviously for education. Positive reinforcement makes the child behave in a certain way that results in a reward and as a result the child is expected or is more likely to repeat that behavior. So, coming out with the right answer. Negative reinforcement, the child behaves in a certain way that results in the removal of something unpleasant and as a result the child is likely to repeat that behavior doing a paper early. In both the cases something happened that you saw as good and as a result you exhibited the behavior more. If it is not felt as good then you would not repeat that one just as you behave when you eat food. If you like a particular dish then you go on asking for more, you go on eating. If it is not up to your taste then you would not touch it again. By mistake maybe the color was attractive and therefore you try to taste it but if it is bitter or if it is of not your taste you won't go there again and you will go to such dishes which you have found as tasty according to your judgment. Let us look at the consequences of behavior in certain other situations. For example, punishment, a consequence that follows a behavior so that you do the behavior less often in the future. I think it works in the case of containing crime. When the policeman catches someone committing a mistake and if the person is taken to the police station or to the court and if punishment is given, what will happen? It is expected that it would act as a deterrent and the punishment may vary from a few days jail to few years to life imprisonment or even death sentence. Punishment can involve adding something, maybe paying a fine, staying outside your natural environment or removing something that you like. You may not be allowed to have your TV your newspapers, your entertainment. Look at the solitary dark cell or solitary confinement. You will not be even allowed to speak with the fellow prince, uh, prisoners in the case of jail. And if you look at the school or the classroom, a child who is seen as not behaving may be isolated from other students, may not be allowed even to talk to them. In both the cases, adding something or removing something you perceive as bad behavior is the result. You exhibit the behavior less and it can be tested, it usually happens. If the child is given this kind of punishment, Maybe one day, next day that will remain very fresh in the child's mind and the child would not repeat that unwanted behavior. Now, these are all explanations, 
not necessarily the gospel truths and I will come to that at the end. Now, what are the differences between negative reinforcement and punishment? Negative reinforcement only tells you that you haven't got the right answer. The thing unpleasant is removed and as a result, you are more likely to do it again till you get the right answer. So, negative reinforcement cannot be equated with punishment, whereas a punishment is a consequence that happens you do not like and you are less likely to do it again. You see the difference, negative reinforcement will not stop you from repeating the behavior until you get the result, but punishment makes you give up, it expects you to reduce that kind of behavior and you will not repeat again something that happened which was seen as bad will not be repeated that is the purpose of giving a punishment. Now, how all these are applied in a classroom situation that relates to shaping new behaviors. Shaping is a process of reinforcing a series of responses that increasingly resemble the desired final behavior. You may be very familiar with certain rigorous training programs organized for either the scouts or the police personnel or the military personnel. When they are recruited, what kind of behavior they have? They are wrong. They are put in a classical conditioning situation and they are tested in every possible way. They have a goal, the military has a goal, the police force has a goal or even sports will have certain goals. Take for example, cricket or basketball. They must know the rules, they have the goals in football, you have to score a goal, in cricket you have to get runs and you have to get more runs to win and more goals to win. Now, these are all perfectly planned. Now, no player becomes an excellent player or a great player instantly. The player has to undergo a series of tests. Recently, the greatest boxer that the world has known in modern history Muhammad Ali died a few days ago. He won 56 boxing uh, competitions out of 61. He got Olympic gold medals three times. How it happened? It was rigorous training. He was shaped or maybe he himself shaped to achieve a particular goal and when a desired behavior occurs, rarely or not at all, we use shaping. First, we reinforce any response that in some way resembles the desired behavior than one that is closer and you go on repeating it. One example from the animal world is who can sit in this chair in a class, do this in a small steps. I think this happens in a class, you shape the behavior of the children and in the animal world, you can train perhaps a bear or even an elephant to sit on a stool and these are all examples of how the behavioral psychology is applied both in the animal world and in the human world. Now, let me come to the criticism of behaviorism. This is something which we must know. External rewards 
may diminish intrinsic motivation. Studies have shown that experimental group is given a reward when finished while the control group is not. After initial period or doing a non-rewarded time, participants are given a choice between continuing to work on the task or to switch over to some other activity. Typical work on the task or switching to um, uh, result is that the participants in the experimental group spend less time on the activity than the control group. This is taken as indicating that reward reduces intrinsic motivation. Pisa Hut used to give away free pizza to kids who read a certain number of pages. This practice was discontinued as it actually eroded students intrinsic motivation to read. Now why? Why it happens? Because behaviorism does not give any kind of room for one's own free choice, how the mind works. And it is quite natural. At a certain age, the child who is so fond of pizza may get bored, may develop taste for something else. And what is given as a reward may not interest that particular child and therefore it gives up. And again, the control group can sustain the interest only for a short time. You take a school situation. As and when the school inspection takes place or a visiting team from the UGC or AACTE goes to a college or a university. Look at the way everyone works. And after the visit, what happens? The so-called normal routine. You can't expect the same kind of motivation, the same kind of performance and the same kind of interest. Now, without that kind of control, then even the normal reward punishment approach does not work. That is why behaviorism cannot be taken as unfailing strategy. There are more critics. Behaviorism, in their view, does not account for anything that isn't an observable behavior. Now, this is very important. How can we say that every behavior is observable and particularly the human behavior? How can we say that if something cannot be observed, then it is not related to behavior either? The critics say behaviorism only accounts for learning through direct experience with the environment, not observational learning. See, for example, a person who has never attended school but goes on observing what happens in the school can also learn. Now, this example tells us that it is not always necessary to have the same kind of conditioning, same kind of controlling situation, even in learning, let alone other instances. Now, check yourself. Can you come up with classroom examples of classical conditioning? Use all the right labels. Then can you give some examples of operant conditioning? Use all the right labels and again use all the right labels to talk about operant conditioning. Give examples of positive and negative reinforcement and also punishment. This is for you to work out and those examples can be discussed later on. 
it is something that the classroom teaching will do most of the time it can be immediate reinforcement or it can be given as a kind of home assignment and then later it can be verified and the teacher can use that one to interact further thank you